Hello everyone, this is your friend and mine, Martin Zender. We have a lot of material to cover today. We are going to look at Peter, the difference between Peter's testimony in the book of Acts and what he wrote to the saints in his first letter. And what happened in between the first time and the second time? What happened between Acts and 1 Peter, uh, namely Romans 13.1? That makes a difference between what would appear to be a contradiction or discrepancy in Scripture. Again, hi, this is Martin Zender. Now, we left off in Acts chapter 5. Now, when the chief priests and all those with him rise, being the sect of the Sadducees, they are filled with jealousy and laid hands on the apostles. Well, of course they are filled with jealousy. God uses these human emotions. I kind of like this. Don't be afraid of human emotions. After all, Paul says that the nations will provoke Israel to jealousy. Oh no, that's a terrible God-defiling trait. Is it really? Well, that produces in them salvation because they become jealous. So God uses human emotions against the humans, which is ultimately for the humans. God ends up being a genius. Hmm. I guess he invented human emotions. So they were filled with jealousy, and they placed the apostles in public custody. Yet, this is the problem with that. A messenger of the Lord during the night, this is verse 19 of Acts 5. A messenger of the Lord during the night opens the doors of the jail. I love that when that happens. Now, this didn't happen with the Apostle Paul, and there's a reason why. It was a new administration, spiritual blessings, not physical ones. Being broken out of jail miraculously belongs to Israel, and it belonged to Paul in his transitional ministry, i.e. Philippi, when the earthquake broke him loose. But then he really didn't escape, did he? Paul didn't run away. No, he went into the jailer's house. How about that? Okay, the messenger of the Lord uh, leads them out, and the messenger of the Lord said this. I love it when they talk to you, too. Go and, standing in the sanctuary, speak to the people all the declarations of this life. I love how the messenger of the Lord put that. This life. This isn't just a this this isn't just a job the the apostles had. It's not a job they retired from. They didn't have a 5013C. They weren't salaried employees in the official sense. No, the, uh, the declarations of this life. It's a way of life to live as Christ. Now, hearing this, they entered into the sanctuary in the early morning and taught. Now, a little um bit of an upset here. When uh, Now the chief priests and those with them coming along called together the Sanhedrin and the entire senate of the sons of Israel and they dispatched to the prison to have them, the apostles, led forth. Yet the deputies coming along did not find them in the jail. Hmm, that's curious. Now turning back they report that, that the prison we found locked with all security and the guards standing at the doors. Yet, this is the tough part, when opening the doors we found no one within. So this was impressive. Now, as they hear these words, that is, the Senate, the Sanhedrin, both the officer of the sanctuary and the chief priests were bewildered. Bewildered, of course. Now, someone coming along reports to them, Lo, the men who you placed in jail are in the sanctuary, standing, teaching the people. That's what they told them not to do. And so they were very gingerly approached the apostles because they were afraid of the people, because the people were many in number. Now, leading them, they stand them in the Sanhedrin. The chief priests and choirs saying, Do we not charge you with a charge? If you're going to charge somebody, charge them with a charge. Do we not charge you with a charge? Not to be teaching in this name, capital N. And lo, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are intending to bring on us the blood of this man. Yet answering Peter and the apostles say, One must yield to God rather than to humans. Now, the God of our fathers rouses Jesus on whom you lay hands, hanging him on a pole. Here's the point. Peter, again, as in Acts chapter 4, one must yield to God rather than men. Okay, now, now I want you to listen to Peter in the first letter of Peter, chapter 2 and verse 13. Is this the same guy? You may be subject to every human creation because of the Lord. Now listen, you're going to hear a guy that sounds like, strangely enough, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13. Now you may be subject to every human creation because of the Lord, whether to the king as a superior or to governors as being sent by him for vengeance on evildoers. Where do you recognize that? I recognize that from Paul, Romans 13. Vengeance upon evildoers, yet for the applause of doers of good. 
And again, in this context as well, doers of good are those who are subject. Verse 13, you may be subject to every human creation. For thus is the will of God by doing good to be muzzling the ignorance of imprudent men as free and not as having freedoms for a cover over evil. But as God's slaves, honor all, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Love the brotherhood, honor all. Love the brotherhood, but honor all. Honor to whom honor is due. Now, one can make the argument, and I'm aware of this, and I'm willing to entertain this, that the Sanhedrin were not a political arrangement. They were a religious arrangement. It would be the difference between a priest coming to you, telling you to um, obey him, whereas uh, a police officer or the governor of, of, of the state. But in Israel, this was a governing body. I'm willing to be corrected on this. But I see Peter defying the authorities at a time when it was right for him to do so because the kingdom was on the cusp and Peter was going to be a ruler in that kingdom. So he was acting in accord with kingdom principles. Tomorrow, I'm going to read several passages from A. Enoch's commentary on Romans 13. And you're going to see that different administrations call for different actions. We don't behave the same in different ad administrations. Now, in verse 16, Peter says, Domestics may do this by being subject to your owners with all fear, not only to the good and lenient, but to the crooked also. To, listen to this. Not only those who are servants in a home, domestics, are to be subject to their owners, not only to the good and lenient. God bless you if you have a good and lenient owner, but to the crooked. To the crooked. This answers Romans 13. It answers those who say that we're to be subject to the government until it becomes crooked. We're to be subject to a good government. But when a government becomes crooked, then we're no longer subject. No. Even Peter is saying, this guy who said we should believe God and not man, even this man is saying post Romans 13 1 that we are to be subject to crooked owners. For this is grace. Yeah, this is grace. I admit that. That's the grace. That's grace. And remember, Paul jumps into Romans 13, 1, from Rome, the end of Romans 12. This is grace. If because of consciousness of God, anyone is undergoing sorrows, suffering unjustly. It's great, Peter. This is grace. It's great if you can suffer unjustly. That's really a bonus for you. You're in the bonus round if you're suffering unjustly. Ding, 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 ding. You are racking up points. Not for salvation, but for a better resurrection. Suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if sinning and being buffeted, you will be enduring it? Well, I'm sinning. I'm disobeying the law. As Paul said, not feignedly is the authority wearing the sword, so you're going to get killed if you, if you go against it. Whether by being in subject or breaking the law. Peter says, what good is it if sinning you're being buffeted? But if doing good and suffering, you will be enduring. This is grace with God. This is when you're in the bonus round. Ding, 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 ding. Verse 21. For for this were you called, seeing that Christ also suffered for your sakes, leaving you a copy that you should be following up in the footprints of him who does not sin. I know we're reading a circumcision epistle, but I think this is applicable. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who? being reviled, reviled not again, suffering threatened not, yet gave it over to him who is judging justly. What does that remind you of? Gave it over to him who is judging justly. Paul, in Romans 12, do not render evil for evil, but give place to God's vengeance. For vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Sorry, I went a little King James on you there, saith. So the reason Peter and Paul are speaking similarly is that Peter was wise enough to realize that a new administration has come. I mean, you don't have to be a jet blue genius to understand that the kingdom you were heralding years ago, I don't know how many years it was between the time Peter is writing this first letter and his testimony at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Possibly 20 years. I don't know. He recognizes, smart enough, smart man this guy, 
that a new administration has come. Something changed. Obviously, the kingdom he was heralding did not come. So he had to have thought back, I would have, on Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Are you at this time restoring the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus very cleverly said, not yours to know the times or the seasons. Because he needed an enthusiastic testimony at Pentecost. So Jesus is not going to tell him, no, the kingdom's not going to come for thousands of years. Because he wants them to believe it and preach it so that Israel can reject it. And uh, send themselves off into... Um, into the back burner of history here for the last 2,000 years. So Jesus, as always, is the example. Peter's giving those to whom he is writing, and the example is, who does no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who being reviled, reviled not again, suffering threatened not, Yet gave it over to him who was judging justly, who himself carried up our sins in his body onto the pole, that coming away from sins, we should be living for righteousness, by whom, by whose wealth you were healed. For you were as straying sheep, but now you turn back to the shepherd and supervisor of your souls. Okay, Peter's getting a little circumcision on us there at the end, which uh, is what we should expect from one of the chief circumcision writers. All right, tomorrow we're going to look at the A.E. Knock Concordant Commentary. We're going to cover some territory, uh, again, from the end of Romans 12 through Romans 13. And then on Friday, at the end of this week, as promised, you've been waiting to uh, see what happens. The poor King Nebuchadnezzar out there in the field. We're going to look at the sequel. We're going to look at the outcome of Nebuchadnezzar's trial, and we're going to listen to what that man said. And he uttered words that not even Christians today can utter. That on Friday, man, what a week. We're going to close this out with a bangaroo.